Okay. Um, well, welcome back for uh, lecture two on test ideals. Um, uh, again, same disclaimer as in the first lecture, if you can't read something I write or understand something I say, please speak up. I can see the chat, um, uh, so feel free to ask there if you like. All right, so um, I wanna pick up uh, right where we left off last time. All right, so we ended the first lecture, um, which was really uh, um, a lecture aimed at showing the existence of test elements and talking about um, test elements for ideals um, and things like that. All right, so we ended with the following sort of uh, corollary of our proofs and uh, definition. All right, so um, we defined an ideal to be uh, uniformly F compatible. If I can get this thing to work. Hmm. Only goes on the right side. Interesting. All right, so um, we define an ideal to be uniformly F compatible if it is compatible with all of the potential Frobenius splittings for all iterates of Frobenius. All right, so take a potential for being a splitting and you have to be sent back into the, the ideal you're talking about. All right, so um, we saw in particular that the finitistic test ideal, or at least it was a, an asserted exercise, right, is uniformly F compatible. So to show that test elements existed, um, it sufficed to find an element in all uh, non-zero uniformly F compatible ideals. And that was what we did last time, all right? So, and um, as a corollary, you get something else for free, <clears throat> namely, there always exists a unique, smallest, non-zero, uniformly F-compatible ideal, right? So, and if you like, take that as your definition of uh, the sort of big or non-finitistic test ideal here, okay? Um, uh, so we're defining uh, in this thing, this non-finitistic test ideal right here, okay? Um, and uh, so uh, I had a lot of trouble in some sense trying to decide exactly what to do um, for these lectures. So I was asked to give lectures on test ideals. And the problem is that to me, there are so many different flavors of test ideals and uh, things to remember that it's hard to know exactly what to say about what, right? So um, uh, I have uh, attempted to, in the notes, put a lot of details down that I'm not gonna have time to say, but I wanna say a little bit about um, uh, so uh, some things that follow sort of immediately from the definition and some other interpretations of the definition that you can see sketched in the, in the exercises that are, are not necessarily all that straightforward. All right, so but let's do an easy one first. All right, so we also defined last time what it means for a ring to be strongly F regular. i.e. Um, what it means, so the definition was that if you take any non-zero element of the ring, um, after taking uh, sufficiently large Frobenius push forwards, you can find a potential Frobenius splitting that sends that element back to one, okay? Not immediately straightforward, but really is very similar to the arguments that we did uh, in the lecture last time, all right? Um, it's it's uh, one of the exercises I think that's uh, meant to be turned in, uh, R is strongly F regular, if and only if this new ideal, uh, this non-finitistic test ideal, right, um, uh, is uh, equal to R, is trivial, okay? So is it not, not completely straightforward um, or pretty easy, but not completely straightforward? It needs to, you need to go through some of the arguments we did last time, all right? So, um, but all the things I'm gonna put here in blue now are exercises right, um, for you to, to look at in the notes, all right? Um, uh, another one, uh, very important here, so the, the, as I sort of mentioned in the last lecture, one of the reasons for looking at these other conditions is that we saw very, uh, very quickly from the definition of the finitistic test ideal that it wasn't so clear that it had any good properties at all, right? So basically it didn't commute necessarily with localization, um, it didn't, um, uh, uh, necessarily pass to completion after you localize to the prime, right? So, however, um, uh, pretty straightforward to check, right? That this non-finitistic test ideal, 
is compatible with localization and completion. Right? Um, okay, so when I say it's pretty straightforward to check, there is still some things to check. All right, so um, uh, I was pretty, I tried to be pretty careful uh, in the last lecture about, it may seem very technical about going through the arguments about what you need to produce a test element, but being able to produce test elements that work in multiple rings is very important for many of the proofs. So in particular, all right, um, uh, um, what you will want to do to see this uh, in many ways is you want to be able to produce a C, a, a test element that will work not only for R, but also remains a test element after I localize or after I complete, a so-called locally completely stable test element, okay? Um, and that comes out of the proof that you can produce such things, right? So it's important, th this proof is very, uh, has a lot of sort of surprising consequences, which is at the source of uh, why the theory has really been helpful. Okay, so these two exercises are very important, but not uh, all that, uh, hard, they're, they're quite uh, tangible. The next ones uh, I've explicitly listed as challenging, right? So these are not meant to be turned in, but are historically sort of very important and also help to explain some of the notation here that I'm using. So let me mark this as challenging. All right, so the first one is, okay, so I've called the small test ideal or the finitistic test ideal. We saw this was the intersection of all uh, all elements that multiply tight closures back into the original ideals for all ideals in the ring, right? And the exercise is to show, well, I know in the first lecture series, um, a definition of tight closure for submodules of a mod module was also introduced, right? And uh, you can check that, in fact, If you look at all inclusions of R modules N inside of M, where the quotient M mod N is finitely generated, right? You could also look at the colon ideals here for the tight closures of uh, N and M back into N. And the exercise is to show, okay, so if M is R and then N ranges over all of the ideals of R. So this is clearly something which is a priori a bit smaller because I've intersected over more things than a than finitistic test ideal. But uh, uh, it's uh, possible to show that this gives you all of these um, elements that knock all type closures of modules back into the original submodule when you're looking at uh, situations where the quotient is finitely presented. Okay, and uh, okay, so uh, you can sort of see some finitistic uh, um, information here. Uh, the the comparison theorem for the non-finitistic one, right? So the non-finitistic test ideal then is take the same thing, but oh, let's, let's just copy it. Take the same thing, but forget about the uh, quotient being finitely generated. All right. All right. So here, um, if you remove all the finiteness conditions, you get the sort of non-finitistic test ideal. Right. And this uh, heuristically should help to explain at least some of the notation and why I've tried to be so careful about writing these two things down. Of course, part of the hope here, and I'll say this in a second, is that you don't have to be so careful um, and that they're really the same object. But I have no idea. OK. All right. So um, and uh, sort of lastly, um, uh, uh, so this is uh, maybe I'll make one more remark about this last uh, equality here, right? So uh, as from my definition of the non-finitistic test ideal, it didn't have anything to do with tight closure, right? So another way to see this uh, last equality is it gives a tight closure characterization of the non-finitistic test ideal, was, which was defined in terms of uniformly com uniform compatibility with all Frobenius splittings. So defined in a completely different way. Okay, but again, if I were to have defined it this way, I would run into the same problems that I ran into with the finitistic test ideal. I have an infinite intersection and I have tight closures that I don't know that localize, right? So um, from this presentation, uh, uh, it's a, a little, it's hard to see nice properties that you do have for the non-finitistic test ideal.
All right, and so let me let Mast mention one other characterization of the non finite statistics test ideal here. So let's say that Rm is local and even complete. Right, so there's another sort of infamous characterization of the test ideal, which is very important, namely uh, this uh, non finite statistic test ideal. You can think about the following way. Okay, so um, it uh, by the previous equality knocks all tight closures for all submodules back into themselves, but the claim here is that you only need to look at exactly one. Um, all right, so that in fact this is the annihilator of the tight closure of zero. Oops. Uh, inside of the injective hull of the residue fields. All right. So again, completely not obvious. Well, okay. So it's uh, clear from my presentation here that um, uh, um, that annihilator is certainly contained uh, or contains the intersection above. It appears in the, the intersection straight above it. Okay. Um, but it's not clear that that's the only thing to check. Okay. Um, uh, and so uh, I've sketched that as an exercise as well. Right, but the way I think about even showing this is to go through uh, and show that it agrees with some of the definitions involving the existence of test elements. Right, so it's it's not completely straightforward here. Okay. Um, uh, any questions about any of these exercises that I've listed? And so, as I said, the first two, which I think I assigned to, as official uh, exercises to be turned in, um, are a bit more straightforward. Everything with challenging and below really means challenging, so right? So um, uh, requires quite a bit more um, uh, uh, work to go into this, okay? All right, so, um, uh, so as I keep going here, right? So um, uh, let me also just mention uh, um, uh, the, <laughs> uh, um, a couple of open questions here. So the non-finitistic test ideal, which we've defined, right? So uh, again, I'm thinking about this sort of as another flavor. We saw that this was contained inside the finitistic one. And the question here, or one thing you could ask is, are they really the same thing? Right? Um, in particular, this would solve some of the problems I asked in the first lecture. We don't know if the finitistic test ideal is compatible with localization and completion, but the non-finitistic one is. So you would get some things like that. Um, all right, so, and uh, this is really an avatar of uh, another question that came up. So, Is strong F regularity the same as weak F regularity? All right, so, and again, um, uh, uh, if you had uh, this equivalence, then you would also get localization and completion for the weakly F regular condition. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, uh, with that, uh, let me sort of proceed with a little bit more theory here. All right, so um, we've defined the uh, um, non finitistic test ideal to be the smallest uh, non zero uniformly F compatible ideal, right? Um, so you might ask, um, what are other ways to produce some uniformly F compatible ideals, right? Well, one, one reason that you might want to do that, right, is that uh, from the definition, anytime you can produce such a uniformly F compatible ideal, then you get that the non finitistic test ideal is uh, smaller than that, right? So it allows you to bound uh, where that thing is, okay? Um, so uh, let me sketch sort of an important set of ideas, right? Which give some other ways in which uniformly F compatible ideals show up, all right? So, um, and this also is related to, to sort of uh, the idea of solid closure, which came up in the previous series as well, all right? So let's just say that B is any R algebra. Okay. Um, what I can do is I can create some uh, ideal which sort of looks like the finitistic test ideal for uh, 
sort of B closure of ideals. All right, so let me just write it down. So look at the intersection of all uh, ideals I and R, right? And what I'm gonna do is look at the closure operation, which is given by expansion and contraction for this R algebra B. So expand up to B and then contract back down to get an ideal inside of R, all right? I think about that as some sort of B closure of ideals, okay? And then you could look at all of the elements that send all B closures back into the original ideal. All right? And the claim again is that this ideal is always uniformly F compatible. Okay, now you run into exactly the same problems we saw before for the small test ideal or the finitistic test ideal. I've written down some horrible gross infinite intersection again, all right? Completely not clear that this has anything that's non-zero in it. Okay, all right. So um, let's say you're trying to show that something non-zero is in it. Um, well, there's an obvious ideal which is contained inside of it. Right, so let me call it the, the sort of trace ideal. Right, so this is the, by definition, is the image of the evaluation at one map from the HOM set, right? And these trace maps will show up here more throughout this first lecture or today. All right, so um, look at the map from HOM BR back to R, which sends a, a homomorphism to uh, phi to phi of one, okay? So that image is an ideal inside of R. Right, um, the, the trace uh, ideal here is trivial, is equal to R if and only if um, uh, there exists an R module retraction from R to B, i.e. R to B is split, right? So that just comes out straight from the definitions, right? Um, uh, and it's pretty easy to check um, that uh, this trace ideal uh, is always inside of this B closure sort of test ideal up on top, right? And again, Sort of the magic of Frobenius gives that this ideal here is also uniformly F compatible. Moreover, um, whereas the first ideal, this beginner section on top, it was a little hard to see whether this thing would be non, had any non-zero elements in it at all. It's very easy to say when the trace ideal, all right, has uh, something non-zero in it, at least, at least to define it as such, right? So the trace ideal is non-zero exactly when um, uh, B is a solid R algebra, okay? So again, uh, what, what's one, re one reason you might be interested in doing this is that if both of these are uniformly F compatible, right? So, and let's say uh, B is solid, right? then uh, um, we know that they're both non-zero, so they both contain the non finitistic test ideal. Okay, because the non finitistic test ideal is the smallest one. Okay, so for any B algebra, at least solid B algebra, you get some pretty direct ways here to um, bound the non finitistic test ideal from above, just using the definition. Okay, any questions? Yeah, so are there any restrictions here on what kind of R algebra B is? Uh, if, it's, if it's not solid, right, then it's possible the top two ideals are zero, right? Sure. And then I'm, I'm out of luck. But mm -hmm. assume it's solid, then there's no other restriction, right? So then you at least get a bound. Right, so um, uh, the sort of the idea of solid closure is then to intersect over all Bs so that it's solid to create and, and uh, we'll see whatever the theorem there is that you get the non finitistic test ideal again. Okay, uh, or you get the finitistic test ideal, as we'll see in a second. Okay, um, so um, uh, sort of uh, before I sort of transition to a new segment, I want to sort of mention a couple of big theorems, if you will related to this. Um, and so the first one, 
is really a, a result, it builds on a, a important results of Hoxter, right? So, um, but the formal statement appeared in a recent paper of myself on Rankaya Data, right? So, and uh, um, in fact, uh, let's say that you're in a complete local setting, right? Then the claim is that you, there exists a, okay, big balance Komakali and hence solid RL to B, so that in fact, the constructions right above all give you the finitistic test ideal, okay? All right, so um, uh, from sort of, uh, for many years, the existence of the, the big balance Komakali algebras, if you will, have been, uh, related to uh, tight closure and, and test ideals, right? Um, and uh, one of the later lecture series uh, is targeted exactly at studying these things and, and uh, it sort of ties in with looking at the uses of tight closure and test ideals to approach some of the so-called homological conjectures and things like that, all right? So, um, but this really uh, builds off of a, a pretty difficult theorem uh, of Hoxter showing that there is some uh, big Komakali B that captures all tight closure relations for all ideals in your ring all at the same time. Okay. All right. Um, so in the second one here, um, move this up. All right. The second theorem, all right, gives another instance in which the constructions of the these Bs uh, give you again. The test ideal, but it does even better. In in this case, uh, it gives you both the finitistic and the non-finitistic test ideal all at once. All right. So the claim is that if R is okay. So uh, to be careful uh, here, while you can certainly extend it, but let me uh, be precise and say, um, if you know what a Q-Gorenstein ring is, I'm assuming that the ring is normal. And if you don't. Um, Assume the ring is norm is Gorenstein, right? Um, and then uh, you'll get something out of the theorem still. Okay. Um, if you take a Gorenstein or a Q Gorenstein ring, right? Then in fact that there exists a, a module finite domain extension, right? So that uh, the finitistic test ideal is equal to the non-finitistic test ideal is equal to this trace ideal of S over R. All right. So the evaluation at one map from the home, okay? Um, in addition, right, uh, if uh, you're in the complete local setting and you look at what's called the absolute integral closure of R or R plus, right? Then uh, you could forget taking uh, something module finite over R and instead pass the co-limit of all such extensions, right? So, um, and then in fact, you get the trace ideal of R plus. All right, so sort of plus closure uh, test ideal equals the test ideal in these settings, right, in some way. Okay, um, uh, uh, so uh, again, uh, this really builds off of uh, sort of the deepest results uh, that's used to prove it are some very intricate arguments of Hunicke uh, and Zubeznik. Right, um, but the formal statement here, at least in the setting I put down, uh, comes out of uh, work of myself with Manuel Blickle um, and uh, or Blickle and Carl Schwed. Okay. All right. So again, uh, these theorems are really just features, featured advertisements, right, for lots of things to look for. Uh, there's uh, much that I can't say in sort of the introductory lecture, but I'm trying to get you excited enough to go look at some of the papers. All right. So I want to change gears a little bit at this point. Um, so. Uh, and uh, sort of the right way to say this is over the years, partly because some of these questions about test ideals remained open for such a very long time, right? Um, there are just a huge number of additional flavors of test ideals, right? For me to tell you about. Um, uh, for me, some of the most important ones, um, uh, and you can sort of already see that coming up in some of the theorems here, right? are things that are, are best motiv motivated by uh, looking at duality, right? So I wanna tell you a little bit now about uh, uh, so-called parameter test modules and ideals, right? Which are sort of a dual version of the test ideals that were already introduced, right? So um, 
so, um, so throughout this setting, and, and I'll tell you exactly when I remove this assumption, right? So let's just assume for this segment that R is Comacaulay, right? You can do a much of this. Uh, you can try and extend things to the case where it's not Comacaulay, but um, you then don't have duality. So um, uh, you really should just, at least as your first attempt through this material, go through it, assuming R is Comacaulay. Oh, okay. I, I don't actually need normal um, in what I'm saying here. So I, I've fixed the notes to... Um, get rid of that. Okay, so uh, R is just an F finite Comacaulay domain, right? Um, uh, I'm going to assume something that's uh, slightly non-trivial, but not too bad either, right? So, um, okay, so as we've said, uh, my rings are all F finite, and so uh, uh, result of Gaber says that uh, R is the quotient of an excellent regular ring. So in particular, uh, it's a quotient of a, a um, Gorenstein ring, right? So uh, R has a canonical module here, okay? Um, uh, I'm going to assume something slightly stronger than that, uh, which holds uh, so long as R is so-called sufficiently local, right? So this statement always holds locally um, and also holds uh, if uh, R feels like it's local enough. So for instance, when R is a polynomial ring, which I think about as corresponding to a contractible space, right? Um, the following is always true. And otherwise you can just localize a little bit and this will be true, right? So um, I'm gonna assume that, uh, so we have that uh, R has a canonical module omega R um, and uh, sort of the magic starts happening when you make uh, a non-trivial identification coming from duality. Namely, uh, if you look at the HOM set, um, Hom R F to the E lower star R into omega R, right? Duality, um, right? Since R to F lower star R is a finite morphism, locally is going to tell you that 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 gives you the canonical module of F lower star omega R again, right? Or of F lower star R, right? So I'm going to assume that that duality holds globally, um, and that's really just a simplifying assumption to make sure I don't have to worry about twists by line bundles everywhere anyway. So much of what I'm saying you can get rid of, right? So, but for simplicity, assume that sort of holds everywhere, okay? Um, and we'll, we'll see an example here for the polynomial ring of exactly what that looks like, right? So um, this is sort of my black box assumption. Right, for this whole segment, okay? All right, so as I sort of uh, get started, what does this give you? Well, the whole point is that uh, because I'm working with this Comacaulay ring, I have Comacaulay duality, right? So what this means is, okay, so I can look at the sort of growth and dig dual, right? Or the Comacaulay dual of a, of a, a module, which is take the module and uh, then hit it with HOM blank omega R, right? Um, if I do that twice, I always get a map into the double dual, uh, hom, hom, m omega r omega r, right, as written here, right? So I have the evaluation at an element map, right? So, and uh, if m is Comacaulay, uh, if uh, m is maximal Comacaulay, then, then this will give uh, something that's the same thing as what I started off with. Right, so I have this dualizing functor, right, or Comacaulay duality that I can play around with. All right, so and much of the theory here is comes out of of just sort of naively applying this functor to some of the the basic constructions. All right, so um, uh, the sort of uh, key uh, map that shows up everywhere is something called the trace of Frobenius. Okay, so again, um, my standing assumption was that uh, I could identify the Frobenius push forward of omega r with the HOM set, HOM f to the e lower star r comma omega r. And if I can do that, um, I get a, a very special distinguished map called the trace of Frobenius, right? And again, we saw this before in looking at sort of the solid closure segment, right? This trace of Frobenius map is just the evaluation at one map, but it's a sort of God-given distinguished map inside of this HOM set, all right? So um, I can take phi and send it to phi of f to the e lower star of one, okay? 
right? So, and if you like, take that as your definition of the tracer for BNES. All right. Now, the magic here really is that once I've made this identification, um, hum f to the e lower star omega r comma omega r, right, is isomorphic to f to the e lower star r again, right, and is uh, as an f to the e lower star r module, i.e., is generated by the trace map, All right? So let me write it this way. All right, so the HOM set, um, uh, so I take any map from F to the E lower star omega R back to omega R, and the claim is that it's always a multiple of phi E, this trace map. So it, it's sort of it's the one map to rule them all, okay? Um, uh, so, and maybe to say it even more precisely, right? So uh, what does this mean uh, very explicitly? This says that you take any such map, right? Call it little phi. Um, uh, and if I look at that map, there exists some element r little phi inside of the ring so that any map here can be written uh, as a pre-multiple of the trace map by some element r phi. Okay. Are there any questions about the definition of phi e uh, or um, what it means for this to generate the HOM set, which are really the two properties I'm trying to say here? Okay. And again, um, I think it's somewhat instructive. Uh, uh, I've listed uh, um, Bruns and Herzog chapter three as sort of a prerequisite set of doc things for uh, these talks, right? But um, uh, if you're not quite familiar with everything in that chapter, which certainly I use as a reference book myself, right? Um, I think to show the statements that you've got here, you just have to assume this isomorphism uh, of f lower star omega r with the um, hom f lower star comma omega r, right? And just naively assume that taking duality on maximal Komokali modules produces the same thing over and over again, right? So for instance, um, let's just see that real quick. And so this is kind of a free form segment, if you will. Right, so um, uh, let's look at some things. Well, one, uh, I know that from duality, right? If I look at hom omega r omega r, right? Well, this really is the the double growth and dual of r itself. So this just gives you r back itself again, all right? Um, uh, so and. Uh, you know, you can convince yourself, uh, um, or one of the sort of main tenets of duality for finite duality for the Frobenius endomorphism uh, uh, says something a little bit uh, sort of stronger or different here. Right, so you could ask what happens when I look at a Frobenius push forward, right, and then take its dual. Right, let's say M here is a maximal Kolmogorov module. Okay. Um, now, um, there's many ways to say this, right? But um, the pushed forward functor is an exact functor, right? And if you're familiar with the uh, formalism of uh, how these things work, whenever I have uh, a left exact functor, it is a right adjoint. And whenever I have a right exact functor, it's a left adjoint. So, in fact, this functor has adjoints on both sides, okay? Um, uh, we saw one of them in the previous lecture series, namely uh, um, um, F to the E upper star, right? So, um, and that is the left adjoint of F to the E lower star, right? But here I need the right adjoint or upper shriek, right? So without sort of saying too much about that, it's pretty easy to convince yourself that uh, sort of using some form of adjointness, I can uh, take this hom and 
move uh, sort of some of the linearity onto the right hand side, right? And when you do that, you get exactly this module hom f to the e lower star r comma omega r. And that's really why that isomorphism I'm using is, is so important is this shows up over and over again. Um, okay, so our assumptions on R precisely give that this, uh, this right entry here, right, is uh, F to the E lower star omega R again. Okay, all right, so I just used this one isomorphism that we assumed uh, as part of our assumptions here, all right? Okay, and now if you buy my mantra from before, whenever you see F lower stars and everything, it's just the decoration to keep track of the linearity and nothing else, right? So this is the same thing as F to the E lower star of hom M into omega R again. Right? Said in other words, right? What's the punchline? The punchline here is that if you look at the dual of a push forward, it's naturally identified with the push forward of the dual. Right? So there's this beautiful compatibility with duality that you get out of uh, sort of finite duality. Right? And so in particular, right? Um, I could apply that to the set of maps from F to the E lower star omega R back to omega R, right? And, right, the push forward commutes with the dual. Which we saw already was F to the E lower star R again, all right? Um, does that make sense? All right, great. Okay. Um, uh, here we see the abstract statement that this HOM set is, is isomorphic to F to the E lower star R. How do I get that it's really generated by the trace map, right? Well, to get that it's generated by the trace map, you just sort of use duality over and over again, right? And I sort of, I leave that to you as an exercise to try and do these sort of next segments, okay? And instead of doing more, right, let me tell you something here uh, about the most important case to keep in mind, namely um, the case where R itself is a polynomial ring, right? So let's say that K is a perfect field of positive characteristic, right? Look at the polynomial ring in some number of variables, in this case, you can show explicitly, all right, well, we know R here is regular, so we know that F to the E lower star R is in theory projective, right? But in fact, um, you can write an explicit free basis to check that it's actually globally a free R module, right? Um, so uh, it's a free R module on the set of push forwards of monomials where you can't pull out uh, any of the variables any further, right? So where all the exponents showing up have exponents that are strictly less than P. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm going to write something here. I wrote something here, which I'm already kind of quivering here, right? So um, I'm working with global canonical modules, right? So it's natural to think of omega r as being isomorphic to r here, right? Um, but this really is the commutative algebraist's definition of a canonical module, and it it makes me quiver inside with fear, right? So um, let me just for uh, the experts in here say that here I'm forgetting the grading, right? Which you never want to do, right? So, but just forgive my sins, okay? So here, identify omega r with r, um, if you will, right? So, um, and then uh, what I'm talking about in this duality segment is you're looking at the HOM set then from uh, of all potential Frobenius splittings again, right? And what this is saying is that every such map can be written as a pre-multiple of some generating map, 
And in fact, the generating map here is uh, very explicit, right? Or a generating map. It's only ever defined up to pre-multiplication by a unit anyways, right? Um, as all these isomorphisms are, right? And that's the problem with all duality in some sense, right? So um, uh, what you can do is you can take this phi e to be the, the projection onto the factor corresponding to the monomial with the largest exponents, right? So the dual basis projection onto uh, f to the e lower star product of all the variables to the p to the e minus first power, if you will, okay? And so I've listed this as an important explicit exercise as well for you guys to do. Um, uh, one should check uh, sort of immediately that uh, in fact, the if I look at phi e, capital phi e, that in fact, we've talked about how to iterate for being splittings, that in fact, phi e here is phi one iterated e times, all right? So in this case, it happens on the nose, right? So, and in, in general, It's always true up to multiplication by units, right? So, all right, so what does that mean? Well, one is I could tweak my phi e to take into account the units to always make it true. And when I'm taking images under, of maps and things like that, you'll never get any different image. So nothing, nothing really goes wrong, right? Um, more generally, um, it just means you have to be a little careful with twistings and things and worrying about how things glue um, and a lot of the theory. But morally, it's true all the time, okay? If that helps, all right? So, but that's sort of the most important example to keep in mind. All right, so uh, let me give you so sort of the next sort of important definition here. All right, what is the parameter test submodule? Well, this is going to be something which very much mimics um, uh, the theory we had before. So tau of omega r. Um, so I'm defining this guy here. Right, is the unique smallest non-zero phi one compatible submodule of omega r, right? Um, uh, what does that mean? Again, that just means that if I look at just this generating map phi one, it should send, uh, oh, total typo. All right, so um, phi one should send tau back into itself. All right, that's all I'm requiring. All right, and so um, here uh, I've done it uh, sort of by the definition from this one generating map, but uh, note that since the generating map of phi one to the E is identified with phi E, right? It's equivalent to say that that holds for all E as well, right? So for any of the generating maps, or more generally, um, it's equivalent to say that you're compatible with again, all of the maps, uh, inside of all of the, these sort of hum sets for all E, um, because they're all uh, generated by the phi E's up to pre-multiples, okay? So, but again, sort of the magic here that's coming out in the sort of parameter test submodule world, right, is that there's one map that governs everything, right? This trace of Frobenius, all right? Again, just like uh, if I were to have naively defined the big test ideal this way, completely not obvious that there is such a unique smallest non-zero phi one compatible submodule, i.e. Uh, it requires justification to say that this, this definition is well posed, i.e. that there is any such non-zero guy, okay? Um, and again, um, adding to the list of perhaps surprising consequences, um, it's not too hard to show um, that um, uh, the previous arguments we have for the existence of test elements, again, produce this sort of by magic, all right? So at least in this case, magic here has a very precise meaning. Magic is just duality, okay? All right, so, um, all right, so, um, uh, um, I've sketched this in the notes, all right? Um, uh, but let me just say that you can check that if you take any phi one compatible uh, submodule of omega, then in fact the colon ideal of uh, omega r into n, right? So the things that multiply uh, omega r back into n, 
is a uniformly F compatible ideal in the previous sense. So again, what does this produce? This produces yet another way of randomly producing a uniformly F compatible ideal inside your ring. All right. Um, in particular, this says that this non finitistic test ideal since, um, will always multiply omega r back into any phi one compatible submodule. Right. So, um, and uh, I, I don't really have time to go through the proof here, but let me just say, uh, what do you have to show, right? So uh, you have to check again that you take any uh, F to the E lower star R to R map and you have to show it sends this colon ideal back into itself, all right? Um, and the proof is to just use duality again. Right, so and I've sketched this in the notes, right? But again, it's kind of instructive to go through on your own. All you really end up needing to use is this one identification again of hom f to the e lower star r omega r with f to the e lower star omega r, right? Um, and everything else just comes out of playing with duality, okay? Okay. All right, so what's the consequence here? Right, so the consequence really is that this parameter test submodule is well defined. Is well defined, i.e., um, you know that uh, the big test ideal times omega r is always inside of any uniform, any ideal which is phi one compatible. Right, and now if I iterate over all of the different multiples of phi and just do that over and over again, I produce an ideal which is manifestly phi one compatible. Right. And hence, I get that the parameter test sum module can be explicitly described, right, uh, by the sum on the right-hand side. Okay. All right. So um, I want to sort of link up real quick back with tight closure, and maybe we'll do this to sort of end uh, the second lecture, and I'll uh, really move on here in a second after picking a um, taking a short break. Right. Um, so give a, another definition here, the parameter test sub parameter test ideal the parameter test ideal of R, right, is for me just by definition, one of these colon ideals that showed up in our proof. All right. So um, we saw that um, uh, or the argument was that if you look at uh, the colon ideal of omega into any uh, phi one compatible ideal, that that was uniformly F compatible. We know that tau was the smallest uh, submodule that was phi one compatible. So look at this colon ideal where you take N in the previous description as tau of omega, All right? So that's the right-hand side, All right? And my definition is that that I'm gonna call the parameter test ideal. Right? Why would you want to do that? Well, um, uh, or what happens when you do that? Again, it links up back to the theory of tight closure, right? If uh, RM is local, right? Then in fact, um, you can show that the parameter tests ideal of the ring, right? So defined is in fact, the set of all elements that multiply all tight closures of parameter ideals back into themselves, okay? So, and maybe this is perhaps the much more classical way that the parameter test ideal would have been defined, okay? All right, um, if I were to do that using the classical definition once more, you run into all the same problems, namely uh, not so clear from at least the description I've written down here that what you get uh, is, um, compatible with localization and completion, everything else. In this case, you can do it by brute force arguments. And uh, this really goes back to uh, some intricate arguments of Hoxha and Hunicke from, from the, the um, origins of, of tight closure, right? Um, and again, uh, you might also have noticed that I haven't put finitistic or non-finitistic anywhere on the board, right? And uh, one of the reasons is that in for these sort of parameter test versions, 
the phonetistic and non-phonetistic versions all agree, right? So they're all the same, right? So again, in the notes, I've gone through and tried to sketch how, how this is. So if you'd like, take these, these statements as a advertisement, right? For things to come later on or things that you can return back to. Um, in fact, one of the later lecture series is about um, F-rational rings, right? So a ring is said to be F-rational if and only if the parameter, uh, if and only if all ideals generated by a system of parameters here are tightly closed and all localizations, if you will, right? So, um, and we see from this that uh, a ring is F-rational if and only if the, the parameter test ideal is the whole ring or equivalently the parameter test submodule is equal to omega, right? At least in the Comacaulay setting here, right? Where I've defined things. All right, so, but this is, uh, this is a big topic again. This is a whole nother uh, topic from the later lecture series, right? So uh, some of these propositions really are not, not so trivial, okay? All right, so um, uh, um, uh, it's uh, 50 some minutes after, right? So I'm gonna take a short break now here, um, uh, redo my notes to say that we're start of uh, lecture three uh, and uh, come back here in a second.